All right, let's go ahead and get started. My name is Marcus with MLC CAD Systems, and today we're gonna to talk a little bit about diagnosing and fixing some equipment. Specifically, we're going through a case study of a winch that I had. So uh, I do a lot of work outdoors, um, do a lot of, of not only clearing of land, but also woodworking, and I've got a wood shop here. And I, so what I wanted to do was kind of take a winch and attach it to my tractor so that I could use it to, in tight spaces, maybe pull out small trees. Um, I've got this uh, ravine next to my house with a pond at the bottom. So I wanted to be able to pull out logs and kind of pull them up the hill. So here I am just kind of one of the applications I was doing where I was just pulling these little trees out of tight spots where they were gonna be hard to get to. Uh, and this winch worked really well. It had plenty of capacity. It was you know, big enough to basically pick up my tractor. So it shouldn't have any problem with capacity until one day it did have a problem and it broke. And so what I did is what any engineer generally does when things break, you take it apart and you look at the inside and stare at it for a little bit. I wanted to figure out what was wrong, what had happened, what broke it. Uh, and as I was tearing it apart, I was trying to figure out how the thing even worked. There's a lot of components in there, main part of it being this uh, planetary gear uh, stack and so I kind of laid it all out and tried to get some assistance. I, at first I tried to return it. It was like 31 days after the purchase date. Then I tried to do some um, warranty work. Uh, they offered me some parts, but it was 10 to 12 week lead time. It was absolutely not gonna be a viable thing. So what I did is I started to kind of reverse engineer everything and see if I could figure out what had caused the problem in the beginning. And it really came down to this clutch. You can see this, this internal spur gear and then this clutch uh, interact with each other and that's how it actually connects and the, connects the reel to the motor. The clutch is spring-loaded. So as you squeeze uh, or turn the handle, it will uh, extend or retract this gear inside the end cap of this housing. And when I opened it up, the, the teeth on this retractable gear were rounded over on the ends and there was a bunch of metal shavings near that end of the gearbox. So that was what was happening. Now, what was causing it? Why did it do that? I don't know. And so I started to kind of theorize. First thing I thought was, okay, this thing is spring loaded. It's got a pretty stiff spring, but if there was something preventing its movement, then when this thing pushed forward, it might either push back or it might uh, cause it to kind of the load to kind of cause it to shimmy back. Uh, but the idea is, you know, if, if I turn this handle and retract it or turn the handle the other way and engage it, it needs to fully engage and fully disengage. So I went into SolidWorks and thought, let's, let's model this thing up and try to figure out what's going on. So what I wanted to do was kind of take this thing apart, analyze it in SolidWorks uh, in an assembly where it wasn't covered in grease, where I could figure out how all the pieces work together. Um, there's a lot of standard components, you know, gears and, and bolts and whatnot. So I could go through and put this together pretty quickly, uh, kind of try to understand the motion, how this thing uh, works. And so I was trying to give it really realistic mates to uh, analyze the motion. I even did a motion study on it. Uh, from that, I, I discovered how it worked and tried to figure out why we were having this problem where the two parts would either disengage uh, prematurely or would not fully engage for some reason. Once I had a full understanding of how they were engaging and what was going on there, I wanted to understand if that was a, going to cause failure. I needed to make sure that the failure mechanism that I suspected was actually the failure mechanism causing this failure. A lot of times I see that happen where things will break and they will try to fix a root cause that actually isn't what caused the failure. Running FEA, you can kind of determine, okay, yes, that's a that makes sense, or no, that's not something that could have caused that issue. Uh, and then at the end of that, I went through and did some 3D printing to solve the problem and get this thing back up and running in a very short amount of time. So let me take you through kind of what this looks like. First thing I did was make some toolbox parts. So with toolbox, um, 
you can create standard parts and fasteners. Uh, I'll show you how to create a gear, but then I also needed to create these planetary stages, which is basically a gear, but then it's sort of connected to or pressed into uh, a plate. And so I kind of had to do a little bit of both, right? So put a part inside of another part to kind of build that geometry. So let's take a look at this. This is my assembly inside SolidWorks. It's not quite done yet. Uh, I've got some of the gears loaded up and what I need to do is add one more gear that's gonna go right here in the middle. Uh, this hex shaft attaches directly to the motor and then that hex shaft is what drives this first gear and then it actually kind of drives back through the stages towards the reel. So to create a toolbox part, I'll go into my design library, expand out, we'll go to ANSI inch, power transmission, gears. This is a spur gear. And so to configure it, just drag and drop. Real basic, real simple and easy to do. Uh, when you drop it out there, it should immediately open up the configure component dialog. Uh, what this allows you to do is set up the pitch, the number of teeth, the pressure angle, the face width. So let's say, this is a 0.289 uh, thick with a keyway of, let's do a half an inch. And what this allows me to do is kind of, oh, half inch is way too big. <laughs> allows me to configure this toolbox part. And when I click OK, toolbox creates the configuration I've asked for. And now I can use this in my design. Now, this one needs a hex uh, opening. So this, this bore actually needs to be a hexagonal so that it'll mate onto this one. And so to do that, usually what I would do is open it up and make the modifications, right? That's how you would do it with a normal part. But this isn't a normal part. This is a toolbox part. And so any changes you make to this toolbox part are gonna you know, affect all other components. And you can see it even throws up a message, you're about to change a read-only document. Now it is possible to uh, clear that read-only flag or to go ahead and set it up to where you can change that toolbox part, but then any changes you make will be applied to all other toolbox parts that are the same. I don't want every toolbox part to have a hex bore inside of it. So you kind of got to be careful with it. Additionally, if you go in to build a part, like let's say I want to create a part that has this attached to kind of a disc to create a planetary stage. To do that, I would just create a brand new part. Well, this is where people start to run into problems because inside of a part, when you drop in a toolbox part, it doesn't want to configure the same way that you're used to at the assembly level. So a lot of people get confused and thrown by this. If you're in a part, you can definitely do this, but what it's not going to do is allow you to size it here, right? What it is going to allow you to do is pull an existing configuration. So if you need uh, a part to be put into another part, uh, such as a, a part that's going to be welded, you know, weld together some hardware or something like that, go configure it in the assembly level and then come in and grab it. This is the 11 tooth uh, version that I was telling you about that I created earlier tell it which pieces and parts you want it to bring in. For this one, I don't need to bring in the material, uh, although there is an option down here that you'll want to keep an eye on, which is break link to original part. Now, this is what really bugged me or got me uh, because I didn't have my file management put together when I initially did this design. So if I click OK and I go ahead and drop this part in here and then I add some additional features, in this case, we'll just do this uh, uh, this disc for this uh, plate that's gonna go on the planetary gear stage, right? I come in, I build it up, everything's looking good, except that this gear still has that external reference to the local file. It's a toolbox part, so it only creates configurations when you need it. So if I had modified my local copy of the toolbox part, and then I open it up in a new version, and I didn't save uh, that toolbox folder, then my files would all be lost because it knows how to create the same size over again, but it doesn't know how to create customizations that you do to the part directly. So you got a couple ways you can deal with this. Uh, obviously, you could just save this out as a separate part, do a save as. 
uh, and create your own part or download it from McMaster Car, right? Then it's not a toolbox part at all. But my favorite way to do it is if it's a part inside of another part, just come in here to the external references on that in context piece and lock it. And by locking it, what you're doing is you're saying, hey, just freeze everything for now. I may come back and reconnect this and unlock it later so I can rebuild it, maybe choose a different size or something like that. Uh, but I don't want to break it, which would permanently break it and permanently remove those connections uh, from that other component. Now, that's what you would do with a part inside of another part. If it's a part inside of an assembly, such as this one where I'm going to come in and actually cut a hex in that, I don't want that hex cut to happen to every other gear of the same type. So for that one, I'll right click and make independent. So make independent basically does a save as, save it where you are, wherever you want to put it. I'm going to just uh, continue with my horrible file management uh, <laughs> practices and stick it on my desktop, hex for uh, gear. And now that one won't get messed up uh, if I my assembly gets, uh, or my, my toolbox gets reset. Now this isn't something that most companies need to deal with because your toolbox should be managed, centralized, and backed up. Uh, but individual users, if you're not really good about you know keeping track of this kind of stuff and you're liable to go you know a long time between projects, uh, you'll definitely want to just make sure that all of your design files go to the same place if you're modifying the core part, the original part that was built. So for toolbox pest practices, uh, if you need to put a part inside of another part, just make sure it's configured in an assembly file first so you can size it. Uh, save those files to a separate folder if you're customizing the file directly, such as adding a hex cut or putting that part inside of another part. Um, if you're just dropping in a standard size and using it as is, uh, as configured, then you don't need to do that. SolidWorks will recreate that in a new part. Uh, if it is a, a custom part and you don't want it to back fill and you know change everyone else's gearbox parts uh, make it independent before you do it or just download it from somewhere else so now that i've got those gears in place let's talk about putting them together with mates so in this case i need this guy to mate right here in the middle uh, so i can come in and apply or add my my uh, mate here so we'll mate this back face to here And then let's go ahead and just mate this face to this face so we can get a concentric. And then what we need to do is add some kind of a gear mate. So gear mates are pretty straightforward and easy to make. You've got basically two options to build a gear mate. So one option would be to take and grab two round faces. Those could be the bore faces like this face and uh, this face over here on this piece and I could come in and say I want to make that a gear mate but you notice that the hole the bore hole is not indicative of the number of teeth that are there so when you come into your gear mate if you just pick two random round faces it's up to you to then decide exactly what the ratio is or the gear ratio is between those two uh, pieces so what I usually do is I'll go in and open up the part. So I've got this gear right here. I'm just going to open it up. Now this is the one that was not, you know, defined or, 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 or edited uh, and saved out. This is still the original one. But what I like to do, and this, this I like to, to save it to all of them, so I like to actually, you know, modify the original one. I put in a sketch and just convert the entities on the pitch circle of the tooth cut. So this outside dash circle, that is my pitch circle, my pitch line. And so you can think of like the pitch line is your perfect sort of representation of this circular object as a gear anyways. And then when you go to create your gear mate, check it out. All I have to do is add my mechanical mate. Here's my gear mate. Pick my two sizes. And the ratio should now be perfect. So this ratio right here should be exactly the ratio of 11 to, I don't know, it's like 23, something like that. 
And so when I click OK, let's double check and make sure that it's going to work out. And it looks like it's meshing pretty well. If you mess up the mesh, like in this case, the teeth are not aligned. That's a fairly straightforward thing to fix. Just come in and grab the mate. In this case, I want this gear mate and I'm going to suppress it. And then I'm going to kind of clock the gears so that they are not interfering with each other. And then I'll come back and grab that gear mate and unsuppress it. And now those two should stay nice and meshed and work out really well. So this applies to this gear out here as well. So if I open up this, this internal spur gear, right? And this this uh, spur gear is kind of a long sleeve. Uh, all the various different planetary gear stages utilize and, and share this one same one. But I can come in here and show the tooth cut sketch, create a new sketch, convert entities on that guy, and then I like to hide the tooth sketch because I don't want to overload everything. But you can see that's going to make it really easy now to come in and add between here and here. I can do a gear mate. All right, so we're, we're cruising right along, right? Feeling pretty good about this whole thing. Um, the next thing I need to do is to um, mate this additional gear here. Now this, this gear is a clutch gear. And so the clutch gear is supposed to come in and out. So it's attached actually to this outside cap. And with this outside cap, uh, let's see. Right, with this guy right here, uh, it's it's sort of recesses in and then it extends out. And I made the, the size of the gear equal to the depth that I wanted it to be able to extend, right? Now that's, perfectly well and good. I could use a limit distance mate and say I want it to go from down here to up here, but that would require that I change the distance limitations in the feature. And for this particular one, if this geometry ever changes, I want that to define my movement restrictions. So if I come in and explode this out real quick, what I can do is add a width mate. And so the width mate is going to be between the end face on this housing and the end face on this cap, this clutch cap. All right now, those two faces are actually going to be coincident to each other, but I'm going to use them as a width mate between this one and this one. And what you'll see is when we do a width mate, we have the ability to define whether we want that to be free or centered or anything else. And I'm gonna collapse this out and I'll show you. We can come in here and tell it we want this to be a free width mate. And that free width mate then allows me to say, I wanna be able to move it in and out back and forth within that, that distance. So here it goes, it comes out and it stops when it gets to one end of travel. And then it come in and push it in and it stops when it gets to the under, end of travel. So it's effectively a limit distance that's geometry driven rather than feature driven. Really simplifies a lot of things. Uh, about the only other thing I could suggest when it comes to mates, especially with this one where I have two states where it could be out or it could be in, I highly recommend you rename your mates. So for example, in this case, I'm gonna call this my uh, free width mate because that one allows me to manipulate it back and forth. But I may want to suppress that and create another configuration here. We'll do this one, or uh, mate. And we'll call this one the fully engaged. And the reason I'm doing this is because it makes it possible for me to quickly change between you know, engaged and unengaged, uh, especially when it comes to motion studies. So when you get to the motion study, you're gonna see the mates can be turned on and turned off at various times. And I can come in and say, I want this to show fully engaged or I want it to show free or whatever so that I can get it to behave the way I want it to go. Uh, in this case, by the way, limit distance, free mates, width mates, things like that. Generally, you should avoid those with your motion studies. 
Uh, it's a lot better to just use uh, distance mates and just manually put in those numbers. That's kind of a motion study uh, tech tip there for you. So keep an eye on those mates. Name them as you go, especially if you've got a lot of uh, situations where you've got multiple states like engaged and, and disengaged. Uh, count the teeth or mate to the pitch circles for your gear teeth. Uh, and then for your limit mates, you know, take a look at that width mate, limit distance, limit angle, all kinds of really good stuff in there to, to kind of make it as realistic as possible. Because what I was trying to do was just visualize in my head what was going on. And what I ended up figuring out was this gear that is this kind of this ring gear, this internal ring gear, does not sit all the way flush with the front of the housing. And so I thought, okay, well, maybe this guy is too small or the housing is too big or whatever it is. And so what that did is it made it to where this did not engage fully. Let me show you what that looks like. I'm going to do a section view. And for this one, I'm going to tell it to section by component. I want to exclude just this guy right here so you guys can see a little bit more clearly. You see how... As this moves in and out, it never fully engages. It engages half, and depending on any tolerancing or any you know grease that's packed in there, it might not even engage that much. And so this was my concern. I, I thought, okay, now that I understand how the clutch works, I could see how this clutch could slip if it didn't quite engage all the way. This to me feels like it might be enough engagement, but with a tolerance stack up, we may have a problem. And so that's what I did next is I went to a tolerance stack up analysis. SOLIDWORKS has uh, two uh, environments, one called DIM Expert and one's called Tall Analyst. They work together. DIM Expert is available for every license of SOLIDWORKS. Um, Tall Analyst does require, I think it's SOLIDWORKS Professional. Uh, but basically what you're going to do is you say, okay, I'm going to give you dimensions in the 3D model. I'm not going to wait to the drawing. I'm not going to wait till the manufacturing, you know, documentation. I'm going to put it in the 3D model, and then those will allow me to stack up the tolerances as we go. Now, this is a really basic stack up tolerance. If you need something more, more, you know, exotic or, um, you know, complicated in terms of how the parts interact, there are tools out there that do that. But let me show you what this looks like. And I went ahead and and created another assembly for this. And the reason I created an assembly for this that was separate is because I kept running into some problems. So let me show you again on this section view. We'll just section away just the housing. What I ended up having trouble with was getting the mates and getting these DIM expert dimensions to match up on the correct instance of the component. All right, so here's how this works. You have to define the information in 3D at the model level, uh, how this thing is put together and how big each part is. And then Tall Analyst will connect all those mates and those dimensions from datum to datum and give you a statistical stack up um, based on the tolerances given of what the most likely uh, dimension range you'll experience in actual practice will be. So to do that, just add a datum feature, a dim expert datum. And that's kind of your starting point. And then from there, you kind of explain to Tall Analyst using mates and dim expert dimensions how this thing gets assembled. So this face right here, from here, you measure down the depth of this bore of the housing. And that's where this ring gear, this, this external gear, uh, mates to it. And so I'm going to come in and open this part up. And I've already added the dimension, but I'll delete it so you can see what that looks like again. Just come in and say, I want to add a dimension. A lot of you have probably already done this before accidentally, either creating a reference dimension or a dim expert dimension when you thought you were in a sketch. These are not sketch dimensions. These are, these are part model dimensions. And I want to go from this face down to this face and then drop the dimension in 3D. And notice this is a dimension, just a normal dimension with a tolerance. This is not a basic dimension. 
This is not a reference dimension. This is not a sketch dimension. It must be dim expert in order for the next step to work properly. So the face you pick is key. This face to this face, those are the faces I picked. So now when I come back over here, what I need is the next component in the stack needs to be attached to that. And so that would be this first stage here. So I'll open that up. And I don't have to worry about it because it's only one face here. But this right here, there's three faces here. So you gotta be real careful about which face you pick or you've gotta add a dimension that actually combines those. It's something you can do in Dim Expert. We've got a cool uh, series of Dim Expert uh, videos on our YouTube channel that you can see how that would work. But again, you're basically just creating these Dim Expert location dimensions to define that thickness. Because this touches the bottom of the gearbox, which goes to that face. That then connects to the face on this gear, which connects to this face, which connects to this face and this face and this face and this face, all the way up to the front of this gear. And so that's where I put another datum. So the tall analyst study, effectively what you do is you say, I want to show you how this gets defined or how this gets assembled. And then I want to see what the total stack up size is. So you would say, I want to measure from datum A to datum B. Actually, this is B to A, but that doesn't really matter. And then I can come through and actually start to define the stack up and how that works. This process is pretty straightforward. Uh, the setup is the key though. If you don't have this setup correctly, if you don't have the datums, the dimensions for the dim expert, and the right face is selected for both your dim experts and your mates, this process will just stop. It just won't go anywhere. But if you get it all set up, you go through and you click on each one of those components, uh, it will read the dim expert dimension and the mating order, and then it'll go through and allow you to measure the overall size and overall shape uh, of this component. Now in this scenario, I went ahead and ran the analysis and found out that the, the, the stack up was not actually a problem. There was plenty of uh, meat there. There was plenty of, of space there for these gears to coexist. So I needed to go and figure out what the next possible thing was. And that's when I went over to simulation. Now with simulation, I made the theory that that engagement that I saw earlier, where it was partially engaged, I thought it was enough material connecting in order to kind of transmit that torque. But my thought was, maybe that's not true. Maybe the torque that's being applied to this gear actually is going to overcome the strength of that because it doesn't have a full face-to-face -face overlap. It's only have about a half face overlap. And so what I did is I ran this in FEA in simulation uh, to check for failure. In this case, this gear overlap, gear teeth overlap, I did go ahead and create a separate assembly in order to kind of study this so I could get just these two components together. Now, when you go to analyze it, you want to simplify as much as possible. So not only did I create another assembly that took out all the extra components, I actually went through and created a configuration where it cut away all the meat and all the extra material, except for just this area where the two teeth overlap. So I got rid of every tooth except for one so that I could go through and set this up. Now, to build this study, it's relatively straightforward, but it does take some time to do. I'll just set it up in a static environment first. Just start at the top, work your way down. You wanna apply your material to the parts. You just pick an alloy steel, should be fine. For your connections, um, these faces are not initially touching. They might sort of become touching. And so what I wanna do is just tell it that I want to do a uh, contact in a relationship or contact interaction. That contact interaction just says that they will be able to contact and push against each other, but then they may need to push back, right? And I'm gonna go ahead and grab both sets of those faces because it might deform here in the tooth area. 
So there's that local interaction. Uh, for the fixtures, for this one, I'm gonna go ahead and just fix this outside piece. And then I'm gonna do a what's called a roller slider. You could also do this uh, with reference geometry or with a hinge or something like that. But basically I'm gonna say that this one is restricted from moving in and out. And then this one, which is a round face, is restricted from moving up and down. And it kind of just puts it on a bearing right through the middle of the gear. So pretty straightforward setup, mesh it and run it. Uh, for, the, for the loads though, uh, I did need to do some analysis or some, some quick math to figure out what the force divided by the number of teeth were to get that, that force on each tooth. So the results here were kind of interesting. I did a nonlinear study because it was past yield. Uh, it actually threw up a warning about going past yield. And it's a little hard to see what's going on. So that's where you like to use the ISO clipping. Just right click the study and say ISO clipping. And you can then narrow down to the areas of highest stress. Now look at this. These teeth theoretically are the same shape and size, but because one is an internal tooth and one is an external tooth, they end up having significantly different strengths applied to them or associated with them. And if you look, we are going past yield in this outside piece. And depending on the tolerance uh, of how everything's put together, uh, it might be closer out to the edge. And I could see how this yielding point out here would start to round that edge over, bend it over, and then it would start to skip and grind. And so that is exactly where our failure was. That exactly matches the failure uh, shape uh, on our design. So that partial engagement, it was very simple. Just simply did not connect all the way, full face uh, attachment and being too close to that edge, loading it up to its full force causes it to skip grind. And then it just wouldn't, uh, wouldn't go at all because it was basically at that point a ramp put on there. So what I did is I went back to the winch assembly and I looked at this design and I thought to myself, you know, this uh, clutch housing has a bore that's much higher or much deeper than this internal spur gear. If I could pull this spur gear out, right, that would really make it a lot easier for those to engage. So I went ahead and grabbed that back mate on that back face, do a little rebuild here for my graphics, pull this forward. If I could get it sticking out up here somewhere, notice how when it's engaged, it's fully engaged. Right? Just I need to take that slack out of this, this gear. So to do that, I said, okay, well, I need then a shim in the back. Notice there's not a lot of space in here, but between the, uh, the uh, uh, planetary gear stages and the housing itself and this thin gear section, I need to create a very precise shim to shim this thing forward. So I did an in-context uh, sketch, real simple and easy to do. If you've never done anything like this, you just come in and say, I want to create a new part and pick a plane where you want it to attach to, in this case, the front plane. And then I can come in here and go ahead and go normal too. And then I can come in and start just sketching it all out and creating my shim. So the shim looked about like this. Uh, I just wanted it to be a nice little stepped shim there so that it would sit in that gear, hold that gear in place and kind of hold it up and shim it up against that part. Now this gearbox gets hot, it's got grease in it. And so what I need to do is create a part that can withstand that. And not only that, it's gotta be high tolerance, both in diameter and in thickness. And if we open this part up, take a look at this. It's really, really thin. It's a very, almost a delicate part. And so what I did to do this was I was looking at, at cutting it on a lathe, but it's actually a fairly large diameter lathe part, four inches in diameter. Um, 
and really, really thin, so it'd be potentially easy to break once I cut it off. I thought about cutting it on a on a, a sheet metal mill or something like that, cutting it out of a round part, finding a, a washer. There was just nothing good that I could do until I started thinking about additive manufacturing. 3D printing, a lot of times we don't think about it, but 3D printing is not uh, something that you have to worry about it being too delicate uh, in most cases, especially as it compares to metal, right? With the metal part, forming it, when it's too delicate, would often break it. So what I did is I just put it into Iger and the Iger Mark Forged Iger software allows me to slice this thing up and it's it's so thin, I didn't use sparse fill. I didn't need to put any uh, reinforcement in it, fiber reinforcement, because um, the Onyx material uh, does a good job. It just It's a carbon fiber reinforced nylon six. And it was done in a few hours, about a dollar and a half worth of material. So it was really fast. Having a 3D printer in your, in your shop or available to use uh, really streamlines these kinds of downtimes uh, with these unexpected failures. So I got it printed and then you can see here, I went ahead and assembled it. It slid right onto the gear. Uh, I measured, measured it with some calipers and it was perfect down to a thousandth of an inch. Um, I had a lot more tolerance available than that, uh, but it did absolutely perfect exactly where I wanted it to be to get that maximum engagement. And I ran another FEA study with that full engagement after designing the shim and, and mating it up to the shim. I then reran my simulation study with the full overlap. And what I found was not only was it below yield, so the gears would not fail anymore, but the the stresses were fur, far enough away from the edge of those gears that the damaged gears could be reused, which is good because like I said, the, the, the warranty service on this was gonna be a good uh, 10 to 12 weeks out. So I reinstalled my damaged clutch housing, put it all together and had absolutely no problem building it or uh, working with it. And this thing has just continued to be a workhorse uh, from that point forward. So pretty amazing that I was able to uh, put this thing together inside SolidWorks, right, in 3D to really understand it. Uh, if I was an expert in gearboxes, I probably wouldn't need to actually put that together to understand how the pieces and how the, the torque gets transmitted through all the various different stages. Uh, but that, that internal gear really kind of threw me on what it was for. But once I got it into SolidWorks, I was able to analyze the motion, turn the movement, and make sure I see and understand exactly how it works, where the loads are being carried. I could check for tolerance stack up problems in the design, which ultimately led me to uh, effectively realizing that there was just a, a poor engagement. I don't know if that was a part was built wrong or, or possibly the housing was too big, but the easiest way for me to fix it was to create a really small shim reassemble it with that shim in place and everything was back up and running uh, and I was able to hit all my deadlines. So I really hope that you found that useful. I had a ton of fun, learned a lot going through and building uh, and solving this problem, but uh, I'm going to open it up, take a second, take a look at these questions, open it up uh, for Q&A.